Hi, I'm Jordan Brutlog, contributor to Firelock Games. This is the next video in a series explaining the rules of Blood and Plunder. This video is going to be focused on Chapter 4, Activating Units and Taking Actions. Each player must have a deck of cards, either typical playing cards with jokers or a faction deck from Firelock Games. These are your activation cards and make sure that you shuffle them well. And try to keep all the cards together too. When you begin a game or a new round, each player will draw one activation card per unit in their force that is currently on the battlefield. You would not draw any cards for units that are in reserve or that have been eliminated. As you can see, I now have three units on the board, so I'm going to draw three cards. If I had two units, I'd draw two cards, and so on and so forth. These cards will not only determine the initiative of the round, but also the number of actions the designated unit will have. Make sure you keep these cards secret unless you like your opponent knowing your strategy ahead of time, and I promise you, this part of the game will be crucial when trying to figure out your strategy. Now, let's figure out what to do with these cards. As you can see, I've drawn three cards, and I've also pulled out an event card, or a joker in a regular deck. And guess what? I just triggered an event. But we're going to describe that later in Chapter 11. What you need to know now is that after the event is resolved, you immediately draw another card, place it in your hand, unless the event keeps you from doing so. All right, so both players have drawn their hand of activation cards. So in this case, both players have drawn three, one for each of their units on the table. Now we need to figure out initiative, or who goes first. Select a card and place it face down in front of you. When both players have a set activation card face down, flip them over at the same time. The suits on the cards determine initiative. Spades typically go first, followed by hearts, then diamonds, and clubs are lowest in initiative. If you're using the activation cards produced by Firelock Games, we've added a feature to help you remember this. You see the pips that are here on the suit symbol in the corner? The card with the most pips will win the activation. But here's the catch. What happens if you and your opponent play the same suit? Then you use the numbers on the cards, and the highest number wins. If you're using a regular deck, aces are ones and kings are 13. If two players have the same activation card, it comes down to the almighty dice roll. Again, the highest roll wins. Ta-da! One last thing with placing activation cards. There will be times when one player has more activation cards than the other, usually because one force starts a turn with fewer units than the other. When this occurs, a player with fewer cards, and only the player with fewer cards, has the option to pass. To do this, the player intending to pass still places the card like normal, once all cards have been set, they just pull the card back into their hand and announce, I will pass, their intention to pass. If you have fewer activation cards, think carefully about when you want to play them. Timing can be everything in this game. Alrighty, so both players have played their activation cards. The English side played the seven of clubs. The Spanish played the three of clubs. They are the same suit, but as you can see, the English side has a higher numbered card, so they are going to go first. Now this card gets assigned to a unit, and that unit is activated. Remember, you can only activate a unit once per turn. Now this unit is going to take some actions, the number of which is determined by the card. If you look at table 1, or on the Firelock cards themselves, you will see how many actions your unit gets. The unit card will have the experience level of your troops on it. That coupled with the activation card determines the number of actions. For instance, if the English side was going to use this activation card on their Forlorn Hope, which is a trained unit, they would get three actions. Once a unit has completed its actions, all of which will be talked about later, take your activation card and place it face up in the discard pile. It's not required, but we find it very useful to place a marker like this little cube next to a spent unit. Sometimes, even with smaller forces, it can be hard to remember which unit was already activated. 
Once complete, the other player will go through the same process and activate a unit with his card. When his unit has spent all of their actions, the round is over. A quick side note here, let's say the English had routed one of the Spanish opponent's units before they had a chance to play the activation card. The card played this round could be used on a unit they had not originally intended, or they can choose to discard it. There will be times when you do not want to play that card on another unit. Then you start a new round and continue this process until all units have been activated. When all units have been activated, the turn is over and you should be out of activation cards. If you have any leftover activation cards after your units have been activated, those cards are discarded before the next turn begins. During a unit's activation, it can take a maximum of three total actions, the exception being if the extra actions are free. There are some units in the game that will potentially receive free actions, which are actions that don't count against your limit. This may be a free reload if your unit is activated on a spade, or a free movement if your unit is mounted. While the action doesn't count against your maximum number of actions, it still counts as an action of that type. For example, a unit taking a single free move action doesn't count it against the total of three actions, but the unit still counts as having moved. It can be very important at times for a certain unit to take more actions than allowed by its activation card. The way to do this is called pushing. A unit can be pushed to be given an extra action at the cost of gaining a fatigue. You are pushing them beyond the norm to get that extra action. While this tactic can be critical, you still cannot go over the three actions during an activation, whether you push or not. In addition, you cannot push them too hard. If a unit has two or more fatigue, you cannot push them as they're already at the brink. We've talked about fatigue briefly and I told you it's bad. Think of fatigue as the toll that a battle has taken on a unit. The more fatigue a unit has, the less effective it is. A unit with a single fatigue marker is unaffected, but any more than that and it starts to limit the number of actions that a unit can take. If a unit begins its activation with two or more fatigue markers, that unit takes one less action. If this means it would take zero actions, the only thing that unit can do is perform a rally action. A unit that has three or more points of fatigue is considered to be shaken. That means these guys have seen enough and are about ready to tap out. The only action a shaken unit can take is a dedicated rally action to attempt to get back in the fight. Rally actions are going to be explained in a couple of minutes. Now we start getting into the fun stuff, actions. There are a lot of them, and they're separated into three types. Standard actions, dedicated actions, and assignments. First, we're gonna start with the standard actions. A unit can take any number of standard actions and in any order the player chooses. However, there is a catch. There may be consequences for taking the same standard action multiple times in an activation. Now we're gonna give you a brief explanation of all of the standard actions. One of the most common actions is to move. For one action, a unit can move up to four inches. Terrain may reduce that distance, but we'll talk about that in chapter six. Measure the base of the model and move the distance you want up to four inches. As we mentioned in the last video, models can usually move in any direction regardless of their facing, so measure from the edge of the base in the direction that unit will be heading. Now, make sure you don't pull a Tim here. If you measure from the front of the base of the model, then place the front of the base of the model at the measurement and not the back, all right? Now, units move as a whole, but models move one at a time. Also, make sure when you move your models to keep the unit cohesive at the end of the movement. Also, when measuring, please remember good sportsmanship. You and your opponent should decide ahead of time how precise measuring for movement needs to be. You can do more of a tournament style where you have precisely measured every model in the unit, or maybe you guys will be okay to measure the first model in the unit and allow the rest to follow behind in the same formation. This can save a lot of time and makes the game more fun. 
A unit can move through friendly units as long as at the end of the activation, the units are clearly separate. It is not allowed to move within three inches of an enemy unit, its control zone, at any time unless initiating a melee, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. One more important thing about movement. If a unit moves more than eight inches total during an activation, that unit will gain a fatigue. Going prone or standing from a prone position is another standard action. Going prone gives the unit a minus two bonus to its range save, but limits the actions your unit can do. A prone unit can only stand up or rally. So why would you go prone? Being prone might just keep a unit from getting pulverized by ranged combat. To mark a prone unit, simply lay down a model as an indicator. Prone units stay that way until they spend an action to stand up, which allows the unit to perform other actions. Now, if you're engaged in melee combat, you cannot go prone. There are no sniveling cowards in Blood and Plunder. And if you're a mounted unit, you can't go prone either. As cool as it would be to ride prone on a horse or ride a prone horse, not going to happen. You would need to dismount before you could go prone. Lastly, going prone or standing up does count as movement when dealing with movement-restricted actions. Like some units can't shoot during a round, they have moved. And though this may seem strange, if a unit is prone, it still counts as standing for the purposes of tracing true line of sight. In other words, you can't make a unit go prone behind a low object like a wall to remove it from line of sight. Although it's not terribly realistic, we did this to keep the gameplay fast and dynamic, not like trench warfare. The next three standard actions deal with combat, which are charge, shoot, and reload. If you want to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat, you need to initiate a melee or charge. If you want to fight an enemy from a distance, you would need to spend one action to make a ranged attack or shoot. After you use a shoot action, you will eventually need to reload. A reload action removes one reload counter, and you can't reload different types of weapons during the same reload action. All of these combat-related actions will be thoroughly discussed in the Chapter 5 combat video. Another important standard action is Rally, which is an attempt to remove fatigue. The target number when rallying is the unit's resolve. During a Rally action, roll 1d10 for each point of fatigue on that unit. For example, this unit of Milicianos has three fatigue markers, so they'll roll three dice. Their resolve is six, so their target number is six or better. Every successful roll removes one point of fatigue. So, as you can see here, he's rolled a two, a six, and a six. That is two successes, which will remove two fatigue markers. Now, the only time you cannot rally is if you push your unit during that activation. The last standard action is throwing grapples. This is exactly what it sounds like. You're throwing grappling hooks. It can only be used while aboard a ship and ties your ship to another ship or a structure. As you can imagine, this will be talked about in detail in Chapter 8, Ships. Next, we're going to talk about dedicated actions. These are just what they sound like, actions that take your entire activation. Think of them as deeds that take more time to accomplish than a standard action. Dedicated actions must be the first and only action chosen by a unit. If there is a test associated with the actions, such as start fire or spike cannons, any unused actions after the first adds a minus one bonus to their target number. For instance, if you look at these Milicianos, you can see they are in formation and have the drilled special rule, which allows them to shoot as a dedicated action. If they were activated with a club, they would receive three actions, so they could use the first to take a dedicated shoot action, and each unused action would give them a minus one bonus to their shoot test. So in this case, they receive a total bonus of minus two to their target number. Also, it's important to know that suit activated special rules are not triggered when using a dedicated action. For example, if you use a spade to activate a unit with the fast reload special rule, and that unit takes a fight action, it would not trigger the fast reload special rule. When a unit already engaged in a melee combat, not looking to start one, continues to fight that combat, it is a dedicated action. All of the details about the fight dedicated action will be explained in the Chapter 5 video, Combat. Now, if a unit is on horseback, 
like this lovely English dragoon, which we plan on releasing, they can use a dedicated action to dismount the unit. All the models in the unit must dismount together, and once off their horses, those models cannot remount for the entirety of the game. When you dismount a unit, replace the horseback models with models on foot because they could have different stats. Once you start using artillery, you may choose to use a dedicated action to spike it, which renders it useless for the rest of the game. This can only be done if your unit is within one inch of an artillery piece. If you're going to spike an enemy artillery piece, it needs to be uncrewed. You can even destroy your own artillery, perhaps to keep it from falling into enemy hands, or maybe it missed too many times and you're just getting even. To accomplish this, roll a d10 for the unit with a set target number of 7+. plus. Remember, if the spiking unit has any unused actions, they will get a bonus to the target number. If a unit successfully spikes a cannon, it can no longer fire, and that model stays on the board as a piece of terrain and a reminder of your awesomeness. A spike cannon cannot be repaired or made to be fired again. Please do not actually spike your cannon as Firelight Games will not be held responsible for the damage. Here's a fun one, start fire. Any unit that has a model within one inch of a structure can try to set it ablaze. Cool, right? The target number to successfully start a fire is 10. Remember to count the bonus from those unused actions to help you out. If you pass the test, you get to place a fire marker on that section. Once there is a fire marker on a structure section, you can't start another fire in that section to add more markers. Nice try though. If you begin an activation with a shaken unit, which means it has three or more fatigue, that unit has to rally. And it is a dedicated action. This dedicated action follows the same rules as a regular rally, but has the potential of receiving a bonus from unused actions. A unit can try to repair a critical damage marker from a structure by using the dedicated repair action. Perhaps your sea dogs torched the wrong barn and need to put it out, or maybe you need to repair a leak. The unit making the action has to be in or adjacent to the section of structure that needs repair. If you're outside a structure that needs fixin', then a model in that unit needs to be within one inch of the damaged section. If you're a good handyman, you will roll a 7 plus on a d10 to make that repair. These next two dedicated actions are performed only on ships and will be talked about much more in Chapter 8. Changing a sail setting will increase or decrease your ship's speed. The Advanced Maneuvers dedicated action is an attempt by your unit to pull off some crazy sailing maneuvers worthy of Lorenz de Graaf himself. The final group of actions are called assignments and there are only two of them. Think of assignments as dedicated actions that last until you change it with another assignment. They have to be the unit's first and only action of that activation. They also do not trigger any suit activation special rules. Using artillery requires a crew to be assigned to that artillery. You can assign a unit to one or more pieces of artillery. Also, you can assign a crew to abandon artillery to do other things. Likewise, you can crew or abandon the oars on a ship, which are called the sweeps, to make it move without sail power. These actions are explained in greater detail in chapter eight and nine. Alrighty, well now we get to talk about commanders and command points. The commander is the leader of your force, the big cheese, the head honcho, El Queso Grande! And as such, your commander has some special abilities. The most important is command points. If you look at this experienced English buccaneer commander, he has two command points and a command range of eight inches. The command range is measured from the base of the commander's model and not the unit. He can tell units within his command range to take action even if they are not activated. For instance, this unit of freebooters here is within the command range of 8 inches and could receive a command point, whereas this unit of English militia here is too far away to receive any extra actions. The clever use of command points can swing a battle, so use them wisely and make sure that you use them every turn. 
The catch is you can only use these command points when your commander's unit is activated. You can distribute them to units in your force, including the unit attached to your commander. Designating these command points happens at any point during the commander's activation. It does not require his attached unit to spend any actions to do so. For instance, this unit of freebooters was activated earlier in the round to reload their buccaneer guns. So they have no reload markers, but they didn't have enough actions to shoot. Now that the commander's unit is active, the commander uses a command point to give the freebooters a shoot action. When you designate an action to a unit that is not your commander's, it doesn't count toward the limit of three actions since that unit is not active. So even if this unit of freebooters over here had used three actions earlier, they are still able to receive a command action to shoot. However, using a command point on your commander's unit does count toward the action's limit because they are the active unit. Using command points is a great way to get around some of the negative consequences of dedicated actions and assignments. This unit of sea dogs that put out the fire in this barn earlier suddenly remembered this was the barn they needed to burn down. Oops! <laughs> They use the dedicated action, start fire, to try and start the blaze again. Unfortunately, they failed to succeed, and their activation ends. Now the commander's unit is active, and they can get another shot. The commander uses a command point, so the sea dogs can take another start fire action. Since the commander can give any type of action, it's okay for the unit to take another dedicated action. And somehow, the sea dogs were lucky enough to roll a 10, and start the barn on fire again, hopefully for the last time. There are a few limits to command points. A unit can only take one extra action from a command point per turn. As we've been doing in the previous examples, using markers to track the spent command points works, so just do it. Now, in this example, your commander is part of a unit that is shaken. The unit activates with two actions and attempts a dedicated rally action. Let's see how we do. And unfortunately, the unit didn't remove enough fatigue and is still shaken. The commander's unit must use the command points on their own unit to attempt another rally and cannot use it on another unit until they are no longer shaken. So let's uh, use that command point and uh, let's see what we get. All right, a success. So they've removed enough fatigue that they are no longer shaken. Now the commander's unit has used that first command point on their own unit, so they can't take any more actions from command points. However, there is still one command point left, which can be used on this unit of sea dogs to try and maybe uh, set another barn on fire. Ah, uh, well, not this time. Maybe not like the previous two. Now, if the commander's unit had failed that second rally attempt, that last command point would go unused and be tossed aside into Davy Jones's locker. Lastly, if your commander's unit is engaged in a melee combat, you can't use command points on other units that are not a part of the same scrum. You can only use them on units involved in the same melee as the commander's unit. Well, that was the explanation of Chapter 4, Activating Units and Taking Actions. If you guys have any other questions, check out the forums on firelockgames.com.